Well, you know, Greg talked about us being there at the conference with him. Oh, clicker. Hi, everybody. Let me know when the clicker will work. <laughs> you know, there's a real feeling of power when you push a button and <laughs> everything changes. I don't know if y'all know that, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, you know, Greg said that he felt like we were there, so I want to give us that feeling, too, that we were there. <laughs> so these are just a few pictures. You want to check the clicker again? We're going to miss out on the best one. There we go. <laughs> Now, there is a story behind this, and I have to tell you. There are some foods that my son won't come within five feet of. And we try to trick him sometimes. And I tell you, there's something in him. If he even gets an idea that there's mayonnaise in it, he's out of there. And so every now and then, we try to fool him. And it doesn't taste like there's any in there. But I tell you what, he'll say, is there mayonnaise in here? <laughs> yes. So this is, um, I think they call it poudine. He is eating. It's a Canadian dish. And it's um, kind of akin to our French fries, our chili, cheesy French fries. It's something similar to that. <clears throat> So now we feel like we're with him. We were with him a little bit also. So, Father, I just want to thank you that you are personally ministering and going into our hearts day and night as we sleep and we go about our daily lives, taking lies out of our heart, going to the places in our heart that would hurt our relationship with you. I thank you that you're removing them one by one, even things that we weren't aware were there, that you are going about healing our hearts so we can have a relationship with you that is face-to-face, -face, free of all guilt and fear and shame. Thank you, God, that it's your work and not ours. Amen. So last week I shared that God had told me that he found no fault in me, but that I had found fault in him. Now, that, both of those statements kind of took my breath away. Even though I've been in grace for a while, to hear God say that he never found fault in me, it still is just sort of like my, my head knows it, but the more it goes in my heart, it's like it, it it takes my breath away. It goes a little bit deeper. And I become more aware of the fact that God has never seen fault in me. That is an amazing, amazing thing to realize. But then the second part of his statement to me was that I had found fault in him. Oh, well, there for a minute it was like I kind of sunk <laughs> down. And it was like, oh, goodness. But what God was wanting to do is he was wanting to bring peace and healing and freedom to my heart and to let me know how he reacts to us when we find fault with him. Because guess what, y'all? We do. We do find fault with God because, well, because we don't know him as he truly is. And he said, he told me, he said, the reason that he never found fault in me was because he always knew me as I truly was. He didn't know me according to the flesh. He didn't know me according to what I did or I didn't do. He didn't know me according to what I could do or I couldn't do. He knew me as I truly was. And who was I truly? An image of God, a perfect reflection of our daddy, 
perfect and complete because that's the way he made me. He never knew you according to the flesh because the flesh is not who you are. Mm, just let that sink in. The flesh is not who you are. That thing that you try to struggle with for years and you try to manhandle it and wrestle it down and try to control it, that is not who you are. You were never created to deal with the flesh. You were never created even to know yourself that way. So a few months ago, God told me that he was methodically removing every barrier between him and us. Now, there's zero on God's side, right? <laughs> there are no barriers between us and God from God's side. But he said there are barriers between him and us in our hearts. They're all called lies. Isn't that good to know? The only thing that ever interrupts a perfect relationship with us and God is a lie. It's not even true. So he said what he wanted to do was he wanted to remove everything in our hearts that would cause us to feel shame or guilt or fear in his presence. He wants us to know that we can just sit with him in freedom and in peace, knowing that he is 100% happy with us. So this week, I'm going to preach about the second half of what God said to me. That was the first part last week. Today I'm going to talk about, but you have found fault in me. Then God said to me, you have found fault in me because you have not known me as I truly am. Boy, that ministered to my heart so much. He didn't tell me that I found fault in him because I'm just a crummy person <laughs> or because I didn't have faith. No, he said, it's because I just don't truly know who he is. And then he told me something that really shocked me. You know, it's one thing when it's in your heart, but when it comes out in words so you can see it, <laughs> you have a, a different attitude about it. He said that I saw him as the punisher instead of the savior. And that just really hit. And I thought, well, Jesus is my savior. <laughs> I've been saved since I was 25 years old. He said, yeah, but sometimes I knew him as Savior, but other times I thought he was the punisher. So that relationship with him was kind of like a ping pong ball, up and down, up and down. Satan's belief system didn't just to come against the identity of man. Satan's belief system also came against the identity of God and his goodness. Satan planted a lie in the earth that we can't trust God, mm. that he's somehow holding out on us. Now, there are a lot of people that have found fault in God. In fact, I'm sure that I can say 100% of people have found fault with God at one time or another. But it's because we haven't truly known God as he is. There's only one exception. You know who that is? Jesus. Do you know why Jesus found no fault in God? Because he knew God as he truly was. That's why. How good. When you know who God truly is, there is no fault to find. Adam and Eve didn't know who God truly was. Because the serpent came and told them that God wasn't good and that he was holding out on them. And they believed it. We can see this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There we see it, a subtle, gentle suggestion that was a lie that told Adam and Eve 
that maybe God wasn't giving them everything they needed. Maybe he was withholding something. Maybe they needed to get life for themselves. Maybe they weren't like God. Maybe they needed to do something to become like God. There are many accounts in the Bible where people found fault in God. Adam and Eve saw God as the punisher, didn't they? After they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God went looking for them. And what did they do? They hid from him. Why? They thought he was mad at them and they were going to be punished. Why was God going after them? He loved them. He was concerned about them. They were caught in this trap. And he wanted to set them free. There was no fault in God there. Cain rejected God's belief system and wouldn't accept the sacrifice that God put outside of his door. God didn't want Cain trapped in a life where he had to do things to be pleasing to God. He was trying to save Cain from a life of death. But Cain didn't know who God truly was. So Cain wanted to live by his own strength and works. He didn't trust God for his life. You know, it so, sounds so funny when we talk about other people. How can you possibly trust yourself for life more than God? I mean, God is perfect, and God can do so much more than we can. Yet we all fall in that trap, don't we? And it's because there are lies that are in our heart. And many times we don't even know what they are. They are hidden and tucked away, but they affect our relationship with God. The good news is God knows what they are and where they are, and he knows how to take them out of our hearts. Job thought that God had caused all the calamity in his life, and so he blamed God for all the death that he was experiencing. He saw God as the thief and not the one that brought abundant life. Until God persuaded Job that he was believing lies. That's what God comes to do with us. He says, I want to remove every lie in your heart. Every untrue thing that you have ever heard about me or thought about me. I want to come and persuade your heart that it's not true. And he's going to persuade our hearts with the truth. When Jesus began to show his disciples that he was going to go into Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he would be killed and raised on the third day, were his disciples in agreement with him? No, especially Peter said, no, don't go there. Don't let this happen. But if Peter and the disciples would have really known who Jesus was, they would have understood that's what he came to do. And they would have been in agreement with him. We've all been there to one degree or another. If God doesn't do what we want, when we want, and in the way we want, <laughs> we can get pressed in upon and that lie will come and tell us that he doesn't care about us or the situation that we're in. I can remember a really good friend of mine. She was dating this guy and... To her, he looked like just everything. He was the one God sent. And God kept telling her no. God kept telling her no. And then one day, God told her to get a picture of a Cadillac and put it on her wall. And she didn't understand what it meant for a few months. But one day, God said to her, you want the Volkswagen, and I want to get you the Cadillac. So God had a better plan for her. He had someone picked out for her that was going to be the person that he knew was the best. But for a long time, she was very distraught, and she was very unhappy, and she couldn't trust God. But you know, God persuaded her heart, and every time she walked by that picture, God would tell her, I'm bringing that Cadillac. Don't go by the Volkswagen. I'm bringing the Cadillac. So we've all been there. Maybe you lose your job or a loved one, or maybe you get transferred to an area that you don't like. Maybe you face an illness or some problems with your children. If your circumstances don't get resolved quickly, 
it's easy sometimes to question God's goodness and character. Now, I used to think that was a terrible thing. In fact, in the church that I used to go to, all the churches other than this one that I used to go to, they all made you feel bad about yourself if you didn't trust God. Like there's something wrong with you. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I can remember just struggling so much, mm -hmm, just trying to trust God. Have you ever done that? I know you have, everybody. <laughs> We Oh, because we want to, don't we? But you know, when you try to trust God, it's like trying to move forward when there is an elephant tied behind you. You can't. It doesn't matter how hard you try. You can't because something is holding you back. That's what the lies do. The lies that we believe about God hold us back. Lots of times we won't even realize what's going on. We just don't feel peaceful um, or we don't feel joy. Sometimes we just quietly retreat from God. And then there are other times when the anger and the distrust just bubbles up and we freak out and we have it out with God. The good news is, is that God wants all of that. He never wants us to run and hide from him. He never says you're not acceptable. Just like when he saw Adam and Eve in the trap, he wants to come to you and say, let me persuade your heart. Let me show you who I am. And then you'll be able to trust me. How is it that we confuse the giver of life with the giver of death? Sounds amazing, doesn't it? John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came so we could have abundant life. So life and death are total opposites. Yet somehow in our heart, there are lies that have gotten intertwined with the truth so that our hearts at times will judge God. So the next question is, what are those things that caused us to find fault in God? I mentioned one, and that's when things don't go the way we think they should go or they don't happen as quickly as we think they should. But another one is, is that in our hearts, God has been um, portrayed as unpredictable. Mm, not in this church, <laughs> but in many other churches. And these churches love the Lord, but they're believing the lies too. And so you see God one minute one way, and then another minute he's another way. And it's really scary because you don't see what caused it to change. And so you say, well, why was he like that now? And then five minutes ago he was like this. It makes it look like he's schizophrenic. There was a popular show that used to be on TV called I Love Lucy. Some of you all might have seen it. Every now and then they show reruns on TV. But Lucy was married to this Cuban singer named Ricky Ricardo. He spoke English most of the time. And you could understand what he said. But when he got real upset or when he got real angry about something, he would start speaking the sentence in English, but then it took over. He was no longer talking in English. He's and nobody could understand what he was saying. Well, that's the view that we've had of God. He starts out this way, and before you know it, he's become somebody else. That did a lot of damage in our hearts. We didn't know it, but it has done a lot of damage. There were times when we saw God as Pharaoh instead of our daddy. Just as Pharaoh demanded the Israelites to make bricks, we thought God was our taskmaster, demanding our good works. We saw God as never satisfied, always wanting perfection. In Exodus 5, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh with a message from God, let my people go. Go from what? The bondage of self-effort and work. 
They were slaves. They had been captured by the Egyptians and made to work. Isn't it amazing? We see that type and shadow. That's what God is all about, freeing us from our own self-effort, letting him be the one that gives us life instead of struggling to get it for ourselves. This is Pharaoh's response to Moses in Exodus 5, verses 4 through 8. And I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version just because it's a little easier to follow. Why do you take the people from their jobs? Get to your burdens. Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The very same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of the bricks which they made before, you shall still require of them. You shall not diminish it in the least. So an extra heavy burden was put on the Israelites that not only did they have to make the bricks, now they also had to get the straw to make the bricks. So Pharaoh in this picture is the accuser, demanding more than is possible, putting burdens on the people that they cannot possibly do. Haven't we seen God like that? through those same glasses, expecting more of us than we can produce. I'm going to refresh your memory. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is, in, which is in heaven is perfect. Now, I don't know how many of you all squirmed and uh, <laughs> hung your head down with that scripture, but man... I thought, that is so unfair. What, what does God expect? I felt so much despair. I read it carnally, and so it brought me bondage, which is the work of the accuser. How in the heck am I supposed to be perfect and as good as God is? And for that matter, what about you? You can't do it any more than I can do it. It sounds like we're being told we have to make bricks with no straw. Be ye therefore perfect, even as, notice those two little words, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. How is God perfect? It's who he is. It's his identity. He didn't do anything to get there. Mm. That's just the way he is. That's the way for us to be as perfect as God is. To know that it was God's job to make us perfect. And he did it. And what this scripture is really saying is, don't try to be perfect in your own strength. Relax and trust that's how you already are. You already are perfect. He's saying to us to enter into his perfection Accept that that's who we are and that we're perfect because he made us that way. Now, I've been in grace for a while, and it would be easy for me to think that I've arrived. But, you know, I wake up every morning and I live with myself. <laughs> and that tells me that I still have a lot of persuading <laughs> that, that needs to happen. And I'm so grateful that God enjoys persuading our hearts. It's what he loves to do. But I thought, you know, I was getting pretty good at starting to trust God. And then recently God showed me this picture of a ladder. And in this picture, I was on the second rung of the ladder. And I was struggling to get to the top. I mean, I was really struggling. It was like the whole goal of my life was to get to the top of this ladder. And then God showed me why I was struggling to get to the top of the ladder. And he showed me that I was struggling for his character to be made manifest in me. I was struggling, wanting the fruit of the Spirit to be flowing out of my life all the time, the gifts of the Spirit. I was doing the seek and ye shall find scripture <laughs> in my own strength. 
Then God showed me the bottom of the ladder, and Jesus was sitting on the floor, just waiting for me to sit at the right hand of God where I already belonged. No struggle, no need to earn anything. God was just wanting me to sit on the floor with him and enjoy fellowshipping with him, to enjoy who he was and who I was, and to know that all those things I was worried about, they were already taken care of. Mm. Rest. That's what God has for us is rest. There I was struggling to get up to this ladder, to get to God, to be like God, success. I'm finally like God by all my hard works and effort. And what God showed me was on the side of the ladder, on the, um, the, the side where you, that hold the rungs together, there was all this fruit. <laughs> it wasn't the right fruit, y'all. <laughs> he showed me that I was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, looking at myself, what I did and what I didn't do, to say whether I was like God or not. Then he reminded me of Isaiah 14:14, 14, 14, where Lucifer said, I will ascend above the heights of the, of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Whoa. And you know, God wasn't showing me this to make me feel bad about myself. He was showing me this to show me that I was in a trap, that I had fallen back into looking at myself carnally instead of seeing myself as already perfect. It's so easy for us to fall back into that trap. We usually don't even realize it's happening until God shows us. Every time we try to make ourselves better than what we already are, we are saying that God has not already done the work. I'm going to say that again. Every time we try to make ourselves better than who we already are, which is perfect, we are saying that God has not already done the work. We're finding fault with God. Do you see how easy the lie comes in? And you don't even realize what's going on. We're judging him and saying that his belief system isn't good enough. It isn't trustworthy. God knew we would have these struggles. So he sent Jesus so we would see who the father was. In John chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, Jesus said to Philip, If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Why was Philip having so much trouble believing that Jesus and the, and the Father were the same? Because one of them was human. Mm, that's why. There are so many little bitty tiny lies in our heart that unless they get squeezed on, you don't even know they're there. But when we look at ourselves and we say, I'm not adequate, we're saying God's belief system isn't adequate and the way God made us isn't adequate. Very subtle, very, very subtle. And so you just squeeze that little lie and then you let God pop it and let him replace it with the truth. Jesus was human, 100% human and 100% God. God sent Jesus to show us who we are. Can I say it? You know, this morning I said, God, you know, some places in this sermon are going to be kind of offensive 
and um, not too normal what people regularly hear. And he said, let me tell you, he said, this is the greatest congregation in the whole world. They don't want normal. <laughs> not only do they not want normal, they haven't heard normal in a long time. And so they are just fine with it. So I'm going to say it. You are 100% human, and you are 100% like Jesus. Mm. That's what God came to do. That's why he's so good. He didn't say, I'm going to get a bride, and that bride is beneath him, a lower species. I want a bride, so I'm going to go create an elephant. God would have never done anything like that. We can trust that when God made us, he knew what he was doing. He made us perfectly. God wants to free us from every misconception that we have about him because he wants us free so we can have that face-to-face -face relationship with him that he wanted from before he made the world. After all, isn't he the one that hung on the cross for you? Wouldn't he do everything else for you also? One of the reasons that we have had this wrong opinion about God is that the church, for the most part, has kept us in our sin. The very thing that Jesus came to do on the cross, the church has undone. Not because the church is bad, but because they're ignorant. They have a zeal for God, but it's with not knowing God as he truly is. So the church made us sin conscious. That we have to confess our sins. Oh my gosh, I remember every night going to bed, I have to remember everything I did and everything I didn't do. And then every time you go to pray to God, you have to check yourself out. And the, you, the Holy Spirit was always showing you your sin and showing us what worms we were. We couldn't even be free when we got to heaven. Like I said last week, there was going to be this big projector screen when you get to heaven showing you all your sins in living color. Really? What sins? What sins? Did Jesus do what he said he did on the cross? Did he take away the sins of the world or not? But see, because we were held in sin consciousness, God looked schizophrenic. On one end, he's saying, I took away the sin of the world. On the other, he's saying, I want you to confess all these things to me. On one side, he's saying he'd remember our sins no more. And then the Holy Spirit, who is one with God, is showing us our sins. How do you trust a guy like that? Mm, there's something wrong, exactly. Even we know there's something wrong with that. But because it had been taught to us, and it was taught in the church from well-meaning people that we thought knew God as he truly was, giving us things and teaching us things that were contrary. Those things go in your heart, and they make it so you can't trust God. It also says, and I think I mentioned it last week, that whenever the law was read, there was a veil. <laughs> the veil was there that made us so that we couldn't see ourselves clearly, but it also made it so we can't see God clearly either. I'm going to go through a scripture that has been so misunderstood, and it makes God look so bad. And I'm hearing it more now today um, than I think I've heard it at any point in my life. It's in Second Chronicles 7.14. It makes God look not good. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Oh, my gosh. 
There are so many things that we misunderstood in this scripture that I won't even be able to cover them all. <laughs> because you're going to get hungry, you know. So, but God's going to, um, at different points and times, make it real. But I'm going to just hit the big, heavy things. So, it sounds like this scripture is saying that God is going to withhold even his hearing us and his healing us until we can get our acts together. We have to humble ourselves. We have to pray. We have to seek his face. So my question to you is, how much do we have to pray? How much do we have to seek his face? And when you feel like a worm enough, when you pray enough, when you seek his face enough and stop doing those bad things, then and only then will God listen to you. Then he will forgive your sin and then he will bring healing. <laughs> Do you see anything glaringly contrary? I just a few minutes talked about God took away the sins of the world. They're gone. They're already forgiven. This isn't saying that God is withholding his forgiveness from us. Come on. God's going to withhold his forgiveness to us until we can get it right. Ah, oh, boy. There's something really wrong there, too. This is saying that God wants us in Satan's belief system. Isn't it? <laughs> You're going to get blessed if you do everything right. You've got to have your act together. So then God said to me, do you really think that my goodness rests on your actions? Mm. There's finding fault with God. See how easy it happens? It can happen when we're reading Scripture. If we misinterpret scripture and we're not reading scripture and being aware of what Jesus already did on the cross for us. Mm. Is this scripture saying that when we pray long and hard enough and get down on our faces enough and seek God enough and know that we're worms, that that's what's going to get him to listen to us and help us? Uh, isn't God already dwelling in us? Isn't he already intertwined with us? I think so. I'm going to read to you what some of these words mean. Humble. Man, for years we always thought that meant beat ourselves up, say what a worm I am, how pathetic I am. How wonderful that God would stoop down to lowly little low me. That's not what humble means. Humble means that we see things the way God sees them. We agree with what God says about us. What does God say about us? That we're made in his image and likeness. That we're just like him. Mm. That word pray. <laughs> This one surprised me the most. It means to judge. Wow. To judge what? To judge ourselves worthy to sit at God's right hand. To judge ourselves the way God judges us. To seek his face. To allow God to persuade our hearts until we can have a face-to-face -face relationship with him free of all guilt and shame. The wicked ways, it wasn't our behavior. It's self-effort and self-righteousness. So this is what this scripture says. When we allow ourselves to be persuaded enough to agree with what God says about us, that's being humble, when we are able to see ourselves the way God sees us, and have a face-to-face -face relationship with God 
free from all guilt and shame, we will know that he always hears us. Mm. We would never again question God. Are you here listening to me? God can't help but hear us, y'all. I mean, come on. <laughs> what are we saying about God? That he can't hear us? We are taking God and we are lowering him. We're finding fault in him. And we will know that we are already forgiven. Then our souls will be healed and restored by the truth that has always existed. Mm, boy, isn't that different? You can feel the difference. You go from this heavy burden of what you have to do just to get God to listen to you to, ah, oh, it's already done. All I need to do is relax and let God persuade my heart about what he already knows about me. That's a good God. That's a God we find no fault in. God said, I have always known you as you truly are, but you have not known me as I truly am. You see me withholding from you. Who told you I was withholding any good thing from you? Oh, yeah, the serpent, the liar, the thief, the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. How many times have you thought that God was ignoring you, not hearing you, not answering your prayers, not talking to you, when the truth is he's talking to each one of us day and night? One morning this week, um, I was experiencing a high level of frustration. And <laughs> I'm just so tired of all the lies that came um, through the Word of Faith uh, movement, uh, specifically for me, that I had to work. I had to earn God's pleasure. And so I told God, I said, I just wish you would nail that word of faith system to the cross for me. And he says, I already did. <laughs> did you see my cry to him was finding fault in him? You haven't done something. Why aren't you doing something? I was frustrated, but my displeasure was also in God. Seeing and believing that he hadn't done something for me. And he so lovingly said, I already did it. It's already a done deal. I was questioning his goodness and his faithfulness, and I didn't realize it. In fact, I didn't realize it until I started preparing for this sermon. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time. When we judge ourselves, we're judging God. How can we trust God when we think that somehow he made a mistake when he made us? Mm. See how deep the lies go? Our finding fault with God, yet we're not even aware of it. So it looks like this. When we think bad of ourselves, our ability to trust God goes right out the window. That face-to-face -face relationship that he so desires for us is not there. When we think that God somehow made us flawed, that foundation for a face-to-face -face relationship with him is gone. And it becomes based on a lie and mistrust. So every time we see ourselves lacking in some way, our hearts, without us realizing it, doubt God. It's not something we're aware of. I never was aware of it, and I don't think I'd ever be aware of it, except that God showed me. 
when we don't like the way God made us, we're doubting God's goodness. Then because we can't trust God, that's when we have to go about fixing ourselves. If God created us flawed, how can we believe he would come fix us? We can't trust someone that would create us flawed. Do you see how the lies are so subtle, so hidden away? What if Jesus would have done that? What if Jesus would have looked at the mess that he was in and didn't know God as God truly was? He would have come down off the cross, wouldn't he? But he knew God as God truly was. So he didn't have the problem. He knew God was right there. It didn't matter what the circumstances looked like. He could trust God completely. When I would think that God wasn't helping me take care of a problem, in my heart I would say, where are you, God? Uh, is that finding fault with God? <laughs> yes. What do you mean, where are you, God? He's living inside of me. He's living inside of you. He isn't going anywhere. Yet that subtle lie comes at us. And it's so easy to find fault. Hebrews 13.5 says he will never leave you. There is only one place that God can be. And that's with you. Mm. What does it say? That was his desire. God had any place he could have chosen to make his home, and he wanted it to be in your heart. He isn't going anywhere. God is so good and so constant in his goodness that even in the middle of our judgments of him, our distrust of him, he is only good to us. He doesn't see us faulty. He doesn't see us the way we see ourselves. He sees us as victims that he wants to set free from this wrong belief system that we're trapped in. Look at God on the cross. The people that put Jesus on the cross didn't know who he was. They thought he was an imposter. First, we're going to look at how the people treated him. And then we're going to look at how Jesus reacted. And this is to help us. God wants us so free. He wants to be able to go after these lies in our heart that tell us that God is withholding something from us. But he wants us to go through him persuading our hearts guilt-free. The church has taught us that we should feel guilty when we don't trust God. Does God ever want you to feel guilty? No. All he does is he wants to come and set you free with the truth. So this is what we see in Matthew chapter 27, verses 38 through 44. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Hmm. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. Whoa, do you hear that? Not only are they mocking Jesus, but they're questioning the goodness of God also right there. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. That's just another way of saying that the thieves were taunting him also. Now you know, if Jesus would have come down off that cross, they would have all been sorely surprised because they didn't believe he was the son of God. They didn't know who he truly was. If they had, they wouldn't have been 
criticizing him and mocking him that way. Now let's look at Jesus' heart towards the people that are finding fault with him. In Luke 23, 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. There is a picture of our God. When he finds his people caught in the trap of lies in the wrong belief system, he says they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. Jesus is so overcome with the needs of the people trapped in Satan's belief system that he's not even concerned with his own circumstances. This man's dying on the cross. He is experiencing crucifixion after being beaten and a thorn of crowns put on his head and drug up a hill carrying a cross. There is no fault to find in God because there is none there. There is none there. The only time we can see fault in God is when we're believing a lie. And our God comes to heal us and set us free from those lies. After Jesus says that, listen to how the people respond. Now he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34 through 37 says, And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided, laughing and scorning him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Mm. He still could have come down off the cross. <laughs> but he didn't. Because he's so faultless that his goal and the desire in his heart was to set his children free. That is what he cares about. We're going to take a closer look at God's heart in a little bit different way. You know, I used to think that that was impossible to look into God's heart, him being up there and us being way down here. How wonderful it is to know that I can know God's heart. I can be intertwined with his heart. I can think what he thinks. I can feel what he feels. In fact, that's his plan all along. God has always wanted our hearts to be intertwined with his. So I'm going to describe this picture of Jesus on the cross in a little bit different way. Um, I'm going to describe it in family terms. Because, you know, Jesus and God are human too, right? Right? So there is this mom and dad, and they're so in love with each other. They have such a wonderful family together that they want to share their love and have children. They get the nursery all ready for the baby. They have fun picking out the colors and the clothes and the baby items. Each purchase brings them more joy. They enjoy each step of the planning, and then that day finally arrives. Their baby is born. They spend hours watching this precious pearl of great price, even while they sleep. Nothing else could ever bring them so much joy. They look forward to the, the day that they can live and share their lives and hearts with this miraculous being in a deeper way. They treasure them and value them above their own lives. Yes, they would be willing to die for this precious life before them. And then the day comes that this treasure of theirs, that they adore, suddenly wants, <coughs> excuse me, to have life apart from them. They have their own plan, and those plans are more important than what their parents want. 
In fact, they've now become suspicious of their parents, and they don't want to be with them to get life. They don't think their parents have their best interests at heart anymore. In fact, they see their parents as their enemy and that their parents don't love them. Many of us have experienced that in our lives at one time or another, especially during those teenage years when a child doesn't know who they are yet. They're struggling to find their identity and think that they need to rebel to find out who they are. All the plans that you had when they were tiny seem to be daggers that torment you now. You would do anything to restore your relationship with them. It's on your mind day and night. There is a part of you that can't rest until that restoration comes. There is the heart of God. That is what God feels, putting it on human terms. That's what we saw in Jesus on the cross. Those that he desires the most, those that he wants to fulfill his lifelong dream are being separated from him by lies, making them think that they have to get life in their own strength. The lies cause them to be suspicious of him, not trusting him because they don't think he's trustable. Yet day and night, God is consumed with having a relationship with you. He is consumed with persuading your hearts night and day that he loves you, that he is good, that he puts your interests before his own. Didn't he prove that to us? He proved it to us on the cross. He'll do anything to get us back. He would die to get us back. Oh, yeah, he did that, didn't he? He did die to get us back. And he said, I will show them my love. I will prove to them that I love them. I will pour out my blood to have life with them eternally. I will search for them. I will constantly chase after them with my love. Now, I showed you a picture of God on the cross, and then I showed you a picture of God's love from a human family standpoint. But there's one big difference between God and us. We have made mistakes with our children, not because we wanted to, but just because we're human. Well, that's what I wanted to say. That's what I intended to say. But God persuaded my heart that that isn't the truth. We've all heard the statement, to err is human, right? You know who said that? I had to look it up. It was a poet named Alexander Pope in the 1700s. Who told him to err is human? Anybody want to take a wild guess? The serpent. God told me that we don't make mistakes because we're human. Did you hear that? <laughs> Mistakes in human, he said, don't go together. Human was created to never even know what it was to make a mistake, much less make one. And then he told me, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we make mistakes not because we're human, but because we live in a fall world and are under the influence of a carnal belief system. <sighs> I tell you what, it's going to take me a long time to recover from God showing me that. And God said, <laughs> gone, gone. <laughs> Human is gone good. Human doesn't make mistakes. The wrong belief system makes the mistakes. God wants us to see him as that God that sees us like that. He is faultless. 
But you see, God never did go under that wrong belief system, did he? He didn't listen to the serpent. He didn't say, my people are not like me. He knows the truth. Mm. This is how God feels. We see it through Jesus in Luke 13, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who continue to kill the prophets and to stone those who are sent to you, how often I have desired and yearned to gather your children together around me as a hen gathers her young under her wings, but you would not. Here we see God's heart desiring to be one with us, to hide us under his wings, and let's find out why. Psalm 91 verse 4 says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Mm. Under God's wings you can trust him. That's why he wants to gather you in. And look why. Because when you're under his wings, his truth, is your shield and your buckler. When we're under his wings, he is persuading our hearts always of the truth about who he is. We've talked a lot about who God says we are, and we'll continue till Jesus comes. But we also are going to be looking at who God is so that we can find out that he is faultless. So those lies that we have believed about him will be taken away as we hide under his wing and we let his truth persuade us day and night. His truth becomes a shield and a buckler for us. Mm. There is protection. There is protection. Father, I thank you that it is your desire that we would all rest under your wings and be persuaded about who you are. I thank you, God, that there is no fault in you and that we can know you as you truly are. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to struggle. We don't have to fight. We don't have to strain. We don't have to work at it. We don't have to work at trusting you. Thank you, God, for setting us free from that impossible belief system. You are coming and you are persuading our hearts with your truth as we rest and relax in you. You are showing us who you are. You are showing us that you're faultless until we are persuaded of it. Thank you, Daddy. Amen. <laughs>